Well, happy Easter, everybody. Good to see y'all. You're like, wait, it's not Easter anymore. What are you talking about, CG? But I think we can keep saying because we rejoice that the Lord has risen. Amen? Amen. Let's sing that right now. Stand with me and sing Christ the Lord is risen today. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Sons of men and angels say, Hallelujah. Raise your joys and triumphs high.
Because our identity is no longer found in fear. We are no longer slaves to fear, but our 
our identity is only through Christ and Christ alone. And so now I want to encourage you all to stand with me for the reading the word of God. We will be reading 2 Timothy verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 7. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the scripture reads, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen. I just want to go into prayer for, over this offering, over this sermon that we're about to hear from Pastor C.G. And I just ask that we all bow our heads. Lord God, I thank you for this time that you've given us to come together in fellowship. Uh, I thank you for allowing us to come together and to sharpen each other, to grow with each other. And I pray over the sermon, Lord, that the word that you've given Pastor C.G. is spoken through the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit alone, Lord, and that his words come from this word and this word alone, Lord. I pray over this offering, Lord, and I pray that the time, the resources that we pour into the body of Christ is seen all throughout our community, Lord. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I wanted to let you guys know that the three ways that you can give here at FBCN is on the QR codes behind your chairs, online at fbcnnorristown.org, or the old school way with the mail or in person. All right. Good morning, church. God is good and all the time. Amen. Uh, if you are a visitor with us today, know you were brought here on purpose and for purpose. Amen. So please fill out the green card to tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, next week, we will hand back those green cards and you'll give a blood thumbprint, okay? Uh, events. Uh, the flowers today were donated by Judy Cook in loving memory of departed family members. Uh, also, uh, today's uh, fellowship uh, offering will be the fellowship fund offering um, for family members who are experiencing hardships, and um, we should give what we can because, uh, you know, I think a lot of us or all of us could be one one step away from asking instead of giving. Amen. Uh, also. Uh, we have uh, Pastor CG will be meeting with anyone who is interested in, in attending an upcoming membership class, and that's today after the service. And last but not least, we have a triannual business meeting, April 14th, April 14th 2024, right after the service. Hello. I'm, I'm Debbie Moses, in case uh, you don't know me. And I have been um, on the outreach missions group since 2006. Yeah. <laughs> um, according to our spiritual gifts, you can sit down now. You can have a seat. Um, if you have interest in any of these or anything that we do, please see one of us after the service. Uh, spiritual gifts for the outreach, apostleship, evangelism, Faith giving, healing, helping, hospitality, leadership, mercy, missionary, service, and wisdom. Uh, we meet the second Wednesday of every month at 1230 here in the church. Um, but you don't need to come if you can't make it. I know a lot of people work. Um, if there's anything that you would like to participate in, pitch in, we're always happy to have have people um, join us. Okay. <laughs> All right. Everyone put your arms out. We're going to accept the blessing. And grown-ups, you put your arms out towards the kids. All right. Dear Lord, we ask your blessing on these children. We ask that they grow up in your love and faith and that you lead them to where you have a plan for them and that they learn about your love today. Amen. Well, let's go to God in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we ask for a blessing upon our time today. 
We ask for understanding as we dive into another topic. It's, uh, we're still you know, coming off the, the edge and the sugar of, of Easter, Lord, and so we just ask that you keep us with that momentum as we learn a little bit more about you today. We're thankful for the new faces here and the familiar faces as well, as it is such a blessing to be able to lead this congregation and this wonderful family in worship and learning more about you as we continue in our spiritual journey together. Let us continue to worship you today, for it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I got my little, um, my little laser pointer here, so I was told if I do that too much for Susanna, she might ca- run around like it's a cat. So I'll, luckily she's not here, right? But I'll need it for my message today because there's some important parts I want to show up on the screen for you. So thank you, tech team in the back that got that for me. Who doesn't like a good meal, right? No one, Polly. Uh, I often think about the greatest meals that I've had in my life. I've been to some really crazy, unique restaurants that I've eaten at, and I wish they were as crazy as the ones that I've seen online. Like, here's this first one. It's called the Chill Out Ice Lounge in Dubai, which comprises 26,900 square feet of ice. The average temperature there is negative 21 degrees Fahrenheit. But don't worry, they give you coats and blankets and whatnot, and they give you warm food to eat. Very unique place to have a dinner. The next one is the tree pod dining, (coughs) where guests sit in small bamboo bowls above the treetops of the Thai rainforest, sampling Asian delicacies while enjoying the view over the Gulf of Thailand. And actually, when I looked up some pictures, you can see some of the lines. Do you know how they get the food to you? Guy on a zip line, literally, comes over to your pod with the food in like this big basket. Just look it up. It's really interesting. Next up, there's the Etha Undersea Restaurant, which boasts the title of the world's first all-glass undersea restaurant located 16 feet below sea level at the Conrad Maldives Rongoli Island Hotel. And I, and I feel like I've eaten somewhere similar before. I, was at, I think I was at Disney World, and they had it, this restaurant in an aquarium, which is really cool. But when it comes to those expensive and exotic restaurants that you go to, the places that you go to, the real essence of great grub is also probably the food itself, but it's also who you're with. And it's why Jesus was so keen on making the Last Supper something to be remembered and used consistently in our walk with him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 to 17, it even says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because where is one loaf, or there is one loaf, we, who are many, are one body, for we all share the same loaf. But why was this so important to Jesus? Well, there's a lot on this that we're going to cover for the next few weeks, and I hope that you can stick around. You're like thinking, how are we going to talk about food for the next, like, four weeks, Easy? Well, I like food, so it's pretty easy. (laughs) But I hope you can stick around with it because it's symbolism. It's of great value to our faith. I remember, for those that don't know, I used to be in youth ministry before I became the pastor here. And even before that, I was at another church. Two churches ago, I was at a church, and I was doing youth ministry. Let me sum it up that way, right? And I took our youth group kids to do a progressive dinner at an all-nighter at the church. So for those that don't know what that means is you go to one restaurant, you get your drink. You then go to another restaurant, and you get an appetizer. Then you go to another restaurant, and you get the main course. And then another restaurant, you get the side. And then another restaurant, you get a dessert. Sounds like a lot of wasted gas, but it was a lot of fun because it was just a unique way of getting one giant meal for yourself that you're like, well, I want a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And we, but we told them when we did that, we said, hey, keep a little bit of your drink and keep a uh, part of your dessert. And they were like, um, okay. So we get back to church. 
We're dri- we were driving around to all the favorite restaurants. We had a great time. And, and um, we came to the sanctuary of the church where we told them to produce the items that we kept. And I told them the brief story of the Lord's Supper and what its symbolism meant and how Jesus' body would be broken, his blood spilled in order to save us from our sins. So those small morsels of like donuts and cupcakes and brownies and the uh, half drunken, uh, half, half drank uh, Mountain Dew or, or fruit punch or something like that, they became our element for communion. Many of the students, they were used to, you know, the traditional way that we do with like a b- bit of bread and some grape juice. But what made it meaningful to them that night was that it was their morsels that they brought to the table. And it was their favorites that they would be able to be used to share in the Lord's Supper together as a youth group. And it was their own spin on it. It made them feel connected, not only to the Lord, but to each other. It was the first time they ever had youth group communion. Our community made it important to them, and that's why I look forward to each and every Sunday, first Sunday here at FBCN, where we partake in communion, just like we will in a few moments. So let's find that symbolism together, because we're going to come to find in the coming weeks that Jesus brings hope to a community of believers who share communion together. You ever heard the term, a picture is worth a thousand words? Probably heard that before, right? Common saying. We all have our own personal pictures that spark memories when we hear this saying aloud. I always think of, like, my Facebook page, and it brings me back to the days when uh, our oldest, Owen, was born nine years ago, our youngest, Logan, who was born almost six years ago now, and when Liz and I were first married, over 15 years ago. The, the pictures always remind me of the stories of what happened those days. And today I'd like to, for us to, to look at a consistent picture that you all have probably seen many, many times before. The Last Supper. This is one of the most famous visual art images that represents Jesus' Last Supper before he was taken into custody. This, this uh, 17-layer painting It was created by Leonardo da Vinci. And I'd like to point out some different words or symbolisms uh, in this picture. The first one is that this painting represents the time during the Last Supper when Jesus said, let's all eat on one side of the table so that this guy can take our picture. (laughs) No, no, it's not. It's not. It's not. No, he, in, in, he in fact actually was going for the, the fact of he was announcing that one among them would betray him. So all of the facial expressions on the painting, it represents a lot of confusion here and worry, right? But Jesus, he's looking pretty stalwart, right? He's, he's like not asking, like, no, nothing's wrong. And he, he, they're just unable to process this. Now, why would Jesus be betrayed? And specifically for the fact that they consider themselves all to be close friends in the room. However, Christ's facial expression in that center, like we said, is calm. It's pure because he's the son of God and he's forgiven of all sin. Even a betrayal by his own close friend, Judas. The second thing I want to point out is to represent the Trinity in the picture, we find that all the apostles are depicted in groups of three. Do you see that? Interesting, right? What, also, what's behind Jesus? One, two, three windows. Very interesting. And then also, Christ resembles a specific shape. Do you all see it? Triangle, Triangle right? Very interesting. Three points, all made. These symbols indirectly support God's power, but still keeps the equality between man and God. Third thing is, where is Judas, you might be asking? Well, Judas, he's the fourth from the left. One, two, three, four. That's really hard to see his face, isn't it? 
No, this is Judas right here. You can see everybody's face pretty distinctly. Can you not? But this one, you can't. It shows this shadow coming over him. It's being depicted as being cast upon him, signifying that he's this impure, he's this contaminated soul. And it's really hard to see his face. But Christ, on the other hand, compared to almost everybody else, almost has this light about him. His face is lit up compared to everybody else, signifying his purity and his holiness. So as we see, art can depict many words in a single painting, just like da Vinci did in this piece of work. Now, some people disagree with certain symbolic theories hidden within this work of art. Some of you may remember the book or the movie, The Da Vinci Code, that came out about 20 years ago. And in it, some people say that Da Vinci's painting depicted different things than what we believe as Christians. Even though we don't know if it's true or not, we do know that if, it's, that if the disciples, and they had a camera back then, they would be able to take a clear picture of what exactly happened. Because camera and photos, after all, are convenient for our memory, aren't they? Every so often I take the opportunity to look at my social feed, like I mentioned before, and I view even all of my friends and my family's photos. Some are recent, others are from like long ago. It's quite convenient, isn't it? You know quite well, I'm sure. You go on, you see all the wonderful events, events that took place for your friends and your family, with or without you, sometimes wishing you could be there if you weren't there. It's surprising how we take for granted that these photos froze a time and place for us to remember. Cameras have been around for hundreds of years and have developed into small ones that anyone can use and might have them at any given time. Your cell phone, for example, usually has a camera on it. So many people <coughs> take a photo and they just upload it to their social media page every single day. Did you know that the rate of photos that are being taken around the world, they increase each and every year? Back in the 1990s, a study was done by USA Today that showed that every second, people took 591 photographs. That's 51.1 million every day. It gets worse, Rebecca. Three billion photographs were just taken during the November through December holiday season back then. But you know what? Today, on Facebook alone, and that's just Facebook. That's like the old person social media, right? That's like what I use. And there's other ones out there, right? But on Facebook alone, 350 million photos are uploaded each day. So that's seven times from what it used to be. That's a lot of photos. They say that a picture is worth a thousand words. So that would be a pretty big book, wouldn't it? 350 million each day is a lot of words. So why do we do that? We spend all that money on photographs to augment our memory so that we can remember. Human beings need all the crutches that we can get to augment our memory. The Bible makes this really interesting statement in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 7, that says the memory of the righteous will be a blessing. And that's because they will be remembering good things. If you start good things in your mind, it's going to be a great blessing to you. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, it just begins, it talks about a bunch of stuff, but the first three words are really important. It says, remember Jesus Christ. It's one of the finest things that you can remember. Never forget what Jesus did for you on the old rugged cross. Keep Jesus fresh in the photo album of your mind. So in that same church of my youth group story from earlier, we had like numerous tack walls in our foyer that were filled with photos of what the youth group kids had done <clears throat> throughout the past few months. And it would be updated constantly. And Liz and I were always updating it. And in the same fashion, I believe that we need to keep Jesus fresh in our minds. I remember even uh, I uh, view or uh, I would even view or introduce those boards to our congregation, not as a board as to what the youth group did that month, but I referred to it as what God had done in our lives and how we keep him at the forefront of our minds. 
After all, it is because of the church that helped these kids feel loved and feel appreciated for what we did for them and, and, and taught them. So today, as we celebrate the Last Supper, I believe this communion service was tailor-made by Jesus himself to help us remember him. I mean, he says in our scripture today that we're going to look at, it says, do this in remembrance of me. So let's take a look at that familiar passage <clears throat> that we're going to talk about. And it's one that we practically read every single first Sunday. So I encourage you to open up to your Bibles to Luke chapter 22, verses 14 to 20. And I'll wait for an amen when we get it. So that first verse, verse 14 says, When the hour came, Jesus and his disciples reclined at the table. So they relaxed at the table. Oftentimes we think of reclining as almost a full, you know, laying down. They were pretty nonchalant, weren't they? Right? Everything was going really well for the disciples and Jesus because they, because they had just entered into Jerusalem. They were being, mainly Jesus, obviously, being praised. That's why we celebrated Palm Sunday just a few weeks ago, two weeks ago. Right? We shout out Hosanna because the king is present. He's here. So the disciples, they're on cloud nine, but Jesus is still close to the ground. He's preparing his path towards the cross that he knows is inevitable inevitable for that next day. Verse 15 continues. It says, And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So this was a passionate moment for Jesus as he talks of his eager desire to eat with them. It wasn't so much that Jesus, or that he was saying goodbye to his disciples, as much as now he arrived at the central reason of why he came to be with all of us, to institute a new covenant with them based on his own sacrifice. This was not the beginning of the end, friends. This was the beginning of the beginning. Verses 16 to 18 continues on. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So, what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that Jesus has not yet celebrated a Passover in heaven. He's waiting for all of his people to be gathered to him, and then there will be a great supper, a great banquet, a great feast. Think of your favorite meal. It's going to be there. It's known as the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. So it's in Revelation 19. This is the fulfillment in the kingdom of God that Jesus really longed for. Our passage ends with verses 19 and 20. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Now, there's a little correction. Not, not a correction, but I want to make sure you're not confused. Didn't he talk about the cup just a moment ago? He said it, he said it only a couple verses ago. And he's talking about drinking the cup now. Well, there was four cups that, that you had to drink. From at Passover. So that first one was, I think the third one, if I'm mistaken. We're going to talk a lot about this actually next week. We're going to talk about what the Passover means as we talk about communion. But I just want to make sure you're not confused. Jesus didn't give the normal explanation of the meaning of each of these foods. He reinterpreted them for himself. And the focus was no longer on the suffering of Israel and Egypt, like I said, we're going to talk about next week, Passover but on the sin-bearing suffering of Jesus on their behalf. So the words, this is my body, had no place in the Passover ritual. And as an innovation, they must, they must have had a really stunning effect, if you think about it, and an effect that would grow with the increased understanding that was gained as after Easter, which we just celebrated last week. This is how we remember what Jesus did for us. 
as we eat the bread, we should remember how Jesus was broken and pierced and beaten with stripes for our redemption. As we drink the cup, we should remember that his blood, his life, was poured out on Calvary for us. This is how we fellowship with Jesus. Because his redemption has reconciled us to God, we can now sit down at a meal with Jesus and enjoy each other's company. You know, the words, this is my body and blood, they kind of give a weird aftertaste for some people. No pun intended. But uh, I, I find it weird to say this is my body, th- body and this is my, my blood that, that Jesus says there. But the precise understanding of these words from Jesus, it's been a source of great theological controversy among Christians. So if I can just be a teacher for a moment to help you out here. The Roman Catholic Church holds the idea of transubstantiation. Can we all say that together? Transubstantiation. We're learning a new word today. And that teaches that the bread and the wine actually become the body and the blood of Jesus. However, the leader of the eventual Protestant church that we're all born from, Martin Luther, held the idea of consubstantiation. Let's all say that. Consubstantiation. It it teaches us that the bread remains bread, and the wine remains wine, but by faith, they are the same as Jesus' actual body. So Luther did not believe in the Roman Catholic doctrine of the transubstantiation, but he did not go far from it, did he? Then you have John Calvin, another theologian. He taught that Jesus' presence in the bread and in the wine is real, but only spiritual, not physical. Then you have the theologian Zwingli, who taught that the bread and the wine, they are significant symbols that represent the body and the blood of Jesus, very similar to how we feel as Baptists. So when the Swiss Reformers debated the issue with Martin Luther at at Marburg, there was a huge contention going on. Luther insisted on some kind of physical presence because Jesus said, this is my body. And he insisted that over and over there. And then Zwingli, he replied by saying, well, Jesus also said, I'm the vine. Jesus also said, I am the door. Are we supposed to understand that he is also a door and a vine? But here, you know, it was, you know, Zwingli was being funny, obviously. But Luther replied pretty quickly. You know what he said? He, re- he said rather tongue-in-cheek. He said, I don't know. But if Christ told me to eat dung, I would do it knowing that it was good for me. <laughs> That's crazy, right? Luther was so strong on this because he saw it as an issue of believing Christ's words. And because he thought Zwingli was just being compromising. So he said he was of another spirit in that way. Scripturally, wherever you find yourself on this, scripturally, we can all understand that the bread and the cup, they're not just mere symbols for us, but they are powerful pictures. We're talking about pictures, right? They are powerful pictures to partake of, to enter into. We see, as we see the Lord's table as this new Passover for all. These are powerful pictures of remembrances. It reminds me of a story I heard one time. In London, there was a Christian restaurant owner named Emil Mettler, who was a close friend of the Nobel Peace Prize winner Albert Schweitzer. Well, Mettler would never allow a Christian worker to pay for a meal in his restaurant. And I was like, ooh, I want to go there. (laughs) One day, he opened up his cash register, and a British secretary was astonished to see among the bills and the coins a six-inch nail. What was it doing there? Well, Mettler explained, I keep this nail with my money to remind me of the price that Christ paid for my salvation and what I owe him in return. You know, that's kind of a, not only a blessing, but it's also that remembrance, isn't it? What a way to, to, to remember to give back, right, as well to the church. It's, it's very common for us to be thankful right after Easter. We're all really thankful. You know, our prayer concerns were not too long today. You notice that? It's because we're all on this high of Easter. We're all really thankful for what God has provided for us. So it's only fair that we say that we need to remember what we owe back to God 
whether financially or through the volunteer work here in the ministry. It's why we had Deb, thank you Deb, to come up front to talk about the outreach group. The next couple weeks, we're going to keep on bringing up somebody after our Connections Point to talk about the various subgroups, the various leaderships that are happening here at church. Because you know what? We can't do the work alone. We really can't. We are only so many. We are, a, a, lo a lot of people love to say that we are a small church, but we are an active church. And we are very active. I'm very thankful for that. And if we want to keep being active, if we want to keep on letting the community know that Jesus is Lord, I really want to encourage you to consider joining up with one of those subgroups. So keep listening throughout the weeks. Remember your spiritual gifts that we talked about just a few weeks ago. Because each time that somebody comes up, they're going to say, hey, do you have any of these spiritual gifts? Listen up. This might be for you. So we need to do everything we can in order to bring forth a remembrance of Jesus Christ. And today we celebrate the communion service of Jesus' final moments with his followers. He specifically designed the partaking of the bread and the cup as an agent to help us remember him. He did this so that his, he did this so with his followers in the upper room, and, he, and, he, and like we said earlier, he was, he was eager to partake in this meal with them, right? And I think he was eager for the fact that he knew that they would remember this meal as one of the finest meals that they'd ever partake in for the rest of their lives. This is not going to say that the bread was anything extra special or anything expensive like the restaurants we just saw, nor was the wine from a fine winery in the area. Instead, the company, the friends we have, but in this case, the company of the Son of God was meaningful. And the spiritual meaning behind the meal would stand out to this small group of men. And it would stick out in their mind for the rest of their lives. So much so that they would write about it so that we would understand what that means centuries later. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 to 26, it says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, but maybe a better word for us would be, Remember, you remember the Lord's death until he comes. This fascinating service today that Jesus instituted is just like that six-inch nail in the spiritual cash register of our hearts, reminding us of what Jesus did for everyone, the awesome gift of eternal life that Jesus gave on Calvary. This reminds me of one more story that I heard. There was this married couple who had a very good marriage. They had a beautiful young daughter until one day uh, that little girl was tragically killed. And that seemed to destroy the happiness in that home. Their hearts, they were grieving. And as time passed, the husband and the wife, they grew apart from one another. Their love for each other just wasn't the same anymore since of the death of their little daughter. And finally, the love got so cold, it got so, uh, there was a bitter hatred that came into their lives and they agreed to separate. They had finally agreed to divorce. And as they were in their home one day, going over the various items that they had accumulated over the years of their marriage, they got tired. They sat down after trying to pack things up and they were taking that moment to rest. And their eyes fell upon a pair of little red shoes which had belonged to their little girl. And this reminder of their precious daughter, it softened their hearts. And before long, they were weeping in tenderness, and God convicted them. They got back together. The marriage was saved. That little reminder, the little red shoes, seemed to be that turning point in their lives together. So let this service be like a, a nail in the cash register, or the, the little red shoes in your life. This communion service is designed by Jesus himself to help you to remember what he did for you. 
And as you enter into this service here, you are to contemplate the person and life of Jesus Christ. When you open a photograph album, you are contemplating what happened there, right? And you, you need to go over the scenes of what Jesus did for you in your mind. Let Jesus bring the reminder of him deep into your heart. Do this in remembrance of me, Jesus said. Today, as you enter into the presence of Jesus, let this reminder of him bring you back into a deeper experience with the Savior. Let this be a turning point in your life. Maybe you've drifted away, and you're coming back to Jesus for the first time in a long time. Remember what he said about you. Give him your heart. And it's a decision that you'll never, ever regret. And it's unique that he established the communion service, the Lord's Supper photograph album, if you will, to help us remember him. What a beautiful thing he did. As we, as we celebrate in communion together in just a few moments, we are reminded that we do this because he instituted this service. And it says, he said, he talked a little bit about this in John chapter 13, verses 15 and 17, which says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Another translation says, you will be happy to do them. And so as we partake in the cup and the bread, there will be a real blessing for each of us. Now this last song that we're going to do to prepare ourselves for communion, it works well with what we've been talking about today and that we will talk about for the next few weeks. It's a familiar song that many of us know. We've sang it plenty of times. It's called How He Loves. And now to many of us, it's just like a normal praise song over and over of simple words of, Oh, how he loves us so. Very simple, right? And that sounds pretty cheery to those that might not know about the song. However, it was written by John Mark McMillan right after a tragedy in his life. One fateful night, his friend Stephen prayed something on the order of, I would give my life for these people that I love as they were talking about their church family. And, yet, and, yet, and that very night, Stephen's earthly existence was ended terribly in a, in a horrible, horrible accident. And Macmillan says, I was in complete shock of my friend dying. And I sat down and I had a conversation with God about it. And that song basically popped out. Though the words are really beautiful, it's a real song of lament from Macmillan. To sing a prayer in pain that leads to trust and as a result encourage us to take our anger and to take our hurt to God rather than just letting it drive us away from him. Jesus felt the same thing that night that he was betrayed. That same night that he was reclining and everyone was relaxed. He felt that way. He knew what was coming. You know what? He was even angry with his father. Well, another verse that we'll talk about later on this, in a couple weeks. He was, fa- he was angry with his father in heaven, having to go through with this. But the lament that he knew would eventually turn to goodness. And that same goodness that we felt last week at Easter and each and every day when we believe as Christ is our Savior. Macmillan, this song author, rec- recalls, he says, I was super angry, and I didn't know who to be angry at. And I came to realize that if you're angry at nobody, then you're really angry with God. Because he's the only one who can change the situation. So I sat down. I didn't have a bad attitude. I wasn't shaking my fist at God. I was just, I guess, hurt. I was really young. I'd never experienced anything like that before. I thought Stephen was the only person who understood me in certain ways, probably the only guy at the time that I could be completely honest about any area of my life, and he was the same with me. There was no sort of pretension. When he was gone, it was like, I have nobody to call. I have nobody to talk to. How am I going to process and deal with life without him here? So I sat down, and that song just sort of materialized. And as I was singing the song, I saw the story of my friend in that song, McMillan says. In my heart, 
I was questioning the love of God, really. I was trying to have a conversation with God. But I think he was speaking to me in the song, even though it's written from my own perspective. So this is the decision that ultimately helps us find the courage to endure the searing pain of the loss that we choose to weep like babes at the feet of the Father and sob. You know, Lord, I know you are good, but I'm devastated, and I don't understand how I can live without this person who meant so much to me. And instead of turning away from God in our grief, we engage him in our own feelings, just like Jesus did that night. We sit between the tension of our pain and hope of his promise. We weep without answers yet with the answer that one day things will be put right. Macmillan also offered some additional perspective of what he had hoped to communicate with the song by saying, in church, we like to pretend that everything's okay. A lot. And, and most of the songs that we sing in church, they're sort of happy songs, but only 15 to 20 percent of the songs that are found in the Bible are actually happy. The other 75 to 80 percent, they're angry. They're sad. And they're brutally honest. For me, the song was not about how much he loves us. He loves us so much that he died, right? It was how he loves us. The way he loves us. He loves us in ways that we, that are not like we think. They're better than we think, McMillan said. The idea that Jesus is acquainted with our situation. We don't serve a God who doesn't understand our suffering and our pain or joy. He's not this sort of mechanical brain in the sky who does things for us when we pray. He's actually a person. And he has experienced life on earth. So, friends, I encourage you. If you're walking through a season of grief and a season of loss, like Jesus did that night, too, I pray that this next song helps to give voice to your mourning and gently lead you to our Father for hope and solace. Let's pray that now as we prepare for this song. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for this beautiful service that serves as a visual and communal remembrance of you. As we cherish and treasure in our minds what Jesus did for each of us personally, may this awaken within our hearts a keen desire to turn from the world and its sinful ways and to turn wholly to you, Jesus Christ. Bless each person here. Bless us in Jesus' name as we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you sing that song, How He Loves Us? Let's stand. He is jealous for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of his wind And mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware Of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory I realize just how
to this table not because you must but because you may not because you are strong but because you are weak come not because any goodness of your own gives you a right to come but because you need mercy and you need help come because you love the Lord a little and would love to like him even more <laughs> come because he loved you and he gave himself for you come and meet the risen Christ for we are his body Communion is for those who have made the decision to accept Jesus as the forgiver of their sin and as the leader of their life. This means that whether you're a member here or not of this church, all that matters is for you to believe in Jesus as your Savior. And you are welcome to this table. Communion was originally celebrated by God's people as the promise of his protection during the Passover of Exodus 12. And then Jesus redefined, as we talked earlier, that celebration of this Passover. And as he and his disciples, they gathered and they ate and they remembered the purpose of that Passover, Jesus made a new promise. The Apostle Paul tells us of the institution of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where it says, I, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it and re in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus promised to spare us eternal death and cover our sins by his own blood, breaking his body and pouring himself out so that we, so that if we believe, we can have a relationship with him forever. And the promise offered as protection during the Passover was a dim reflection of the great promise that Jesus made and fulfilled. A promise of life forever. 
Now, we're not supposed to take communion if we have any bitterness or an unforgiving attitude in our own hearts. So let's just take a few moments to allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and show us if we're holding on to any grudges. And if you are, ask God to help you forgive and let go as we pray right now. Will you pray with me? Loving God, we praise and thank you for your love shown to us in Jesus Christ. We thank you for his life and ministry, announcing the good news of your kingdom and demonstrating its power by lifting up the downtrodden and healing the sick and loving the loveless. We thank you for his sacrificial death upon the cross, for the redemption of the entire world, and for raising him to life again as a foretaste of the glory we shall all share. We give you thanks for this bread and this cup, symbols of our world and signs of your transforming love. Send your Holy Spirit, Lord, we pray, that we may be renewed into the likeness of Jesus Christ and formed into his body. Forgive us the sins that we hold on to so that we may partake in this wonderful meal together as a community. And we pray this in the same words that he taught us praying by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. this means a little bit more today and the next few weeks as we talk about communion. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Friends, eat and drink and never hunger or thirst again. Amen. <clears throat> now we know that the disciples gathered together after that first or I should say the Last Supper, and they sang a hymn. So we're going to do the same. And the way we do it here at our church is we gather together in a circle. So we encourage you to gather around, and let's create a circle to sing. Let's be the tie that binds. Bless be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The Each year here at BCN, we have a single word that we reflect on and are actively pursuing, and this year our word is hope. This world is full of a lot of pain, and if we focus on the hurt that we've experienced, it can keep us stuck in this cycle of suffering like a depressing song that never ends. When we continuously replay the pain in our minds, it becomes difficult to move forward and to find that peace. So instead of focusing on that pain, our church has agreed to focus on the hope in our lives. As 1 Timothy 4.10 says, and let's say this together, friends. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. We're striving to be better friends. We're trying to grasp hope. We're trying to make it tangible and tell others of the hope that Jesus Christ gives us each and every day to live. And I hope that you know that I love you, church, but more importantly, God loves you. Go in peace, church.